I think it'll be really helpful for everybody to share their insights and, and um, what got them to where they are. And um, what I'll start by saying is the most important things to me have, have really been finding a niche within neurosurgery and neurosurgical research and just enjoying the journey along the way. I, I started this in medical school and I had a picture up of, of my mentors throughout this. Um, I had the good fortune of um, being a laboratory medical student with Sander Connolly uh, at Columbia. And I think, I think as many great research mentors there are out there, he's, he's truly one of the gold standards. And, and why I say that is if we had a list of people who trained in his laboratory in neurosurgery, who then went on to academic careers and successful research careers, it would be immense. And the reason I bring up that point is because I think getting involved early is, is really critical and learning the process. It doesn't matter if you publish a cell paper or if you publish 20 clinical papers, I think the, the concept of learning how to do research is super important. So I think early on, that's important. The next picture I had up that I would have shared would have been my department chair, Dr. Giannata, who has been exceedingly supportive of all the research efforts of our faculty members and our residents. And I think it's also of critical importance, not just to have a, a lab mentor as a medical student or a resident, but a supportive environment. And that's critical. And the third the third phase of that would be my scientific mentor, Dr. Zlokovic. He's, he's not a neurosurgeon scientist, he's a PhD, but as old as you get in your career, whether it's a senior resident or an attending or a full professor or a chair, I would argue that you still have collaborators and mentors and that's absolutely critical. And um, you're learning along the way. The, the thing that's been most important to me throughout my career is, is two things. First, it's been truly finding a niche. And I think uh, Manish and Mike can tell you about what their niche is, but I studied inflammation uh, in cerebrovascular disease in medical school and residency. And when I got to USC, I found this wonderful opportunity to, um, to plug myself in with a group of environmental engineers who uh, did research in air pollution and traffic related air pollution. They collected air pollution off of the 10 freeway, the 110 freeway, and then we exposed our mice to that air pollution and we looked at the effects on stroke and cerebral hypoperfusion. So it's allowed me to, to develop a niche that nobody else studies. There isn't another neurosurgeon who's studying environmental exposures and stroke, or at least not particulate matter and air pollution. So it gives, it gives you the opportunity to become an expert, an expert in something that, uh, that, that, you know, you can, you can hold dear to yourself and you could speak on and you could, educate others on. So I think that's been very important. The other critical thing that I learned along the way, and maybe I did right at the beginning, or maybe I could have done a little better, is it's really important to develop a niche that uh, becomes efficient with your, with your clinical practice. So we don't spend all day in the laboratory, and we do compete with PhDs. Whether you did a PhD or did not, I think um, I did not. I, I the other panelists uh, uh, may have. I know at least one did. Um, that, that's the question came up before. I, I think that's not relevant in so much as the letters or the labels. It's, it's just the learning. And as long as you learn the science, but you are competing scientifically with people who are working all day in the laboratory. So I think as neurosurgeons, what we can really do is one of two things. You can either successfully study a disease that matters to you and that you see in your clinic, or you can successfully leverage something that you have that nobody else has access to, whether that's, you know, physiologic recordings in the human brain or tissue samples that you can get. I think those are the two ways that um, neurosurgeons can become effective in, um, in translating their clinical practice into a research interest and a, and a clinical, science, clinical science interest. The way I thought about it when I was a med student and a resident is you're gonna, you're gonna interview for residency one day and it'll be one day pretty soon. And you're gonna sit there in front of a number of um, faculty members. And if it's academic neurosurgery that you're interested in, you're gonna be asked to tell a story. You're gonna be asked to tell the story of what, what is it that you're interested in you've done. And I would say that amplifies itself when you go for your faculty interview. You know you're gonna be giving grand rounds one day as a faculty member when you're applying to these jobs out in the 
community or in the academic setting. I think this talk really focuses on the academic setting, but you need to have a story. You need to have something that you're passionate about, something that you've worked on, something that you've, uh, that, that you've spent time on. Uh, it's not the number of publications that count. It's not the hours it's spent. It's, it's, it's how you've moved your interest forward and have focused on something that might add to the, uh, to the, you know, to the neurosurgical world, neurosurgical literature, and most importantly to our patients' uh, well-being, as, as Mike Lim mentioned this morning. That's what we're in it for, and that's, and that's why we're doing this. So I think the things that, I, that I've stressed that have, I, I think I want you to take away from, from my uh, two cents would be that mentorship in the environment is absolutely critical. Learning how to think and how to do scientifically is absolutely critical. And doing something that's efficient and that you can leverage to, to, to tell your story is, uh, is, I think, the way to succeed in, in neurosurgical research. There's many ways to do it. That's, that's, been, my, that's been my feeling. So I'll, I'll pause on that and give a little time for the others um, to, to talk. Thanks, uh, Bill. That was great. I'm, I would say my perspective is, shares a lot of similar themes. Um, uh, and just a couple of points I'll touch on. So my background, I am an MD, PhD, and, um, and now run a lab in studying the brain tumor microenvironment. I would say that um, there's nothing magical about the PhD, and it's a common question people ask. And ultimately, at the end of the day, um, whether it's a gap year or a PhD, um, these are what I tell students that I advise and what I told myself when I had to make the decisions is these are personal choices. You have a, a journey ahead of you and the opportunity to define it based on your own personal passions and interests. So, um, and that's really what needs to guide your decision-making. It should not be, oh, what will the residencies think when I apply? Like, don't, if you start thinking like that, you fall into a trap that will inevitably lead to a lesser outcome. But if you think based on, you know, I really care about why um, patients with brain tumors are not responding to immunotherapy, or I really care why we can't predict which aneurysm patients will run into trouble. And if it, and, and I want to, you know, do my part to help solve that, whether it be in a year or in three years as a, as a PhD student, that will come through very clearly when you interview and talk to colleagues. And, and that when I when I tell people what makes a good sub eye talk or a good job talk, it's that passion that, you know, you really can't fake. It's pretty authentic and genuine. So for me, the choice to do a PhD was just, I wanted to take a deeper dive in the lab and, and I loved it. Um, and when I did my PhD, I um, at the same time wanted it to be very translational. So I studied viral gene therapies for brain tumors and, and with the hopes of developing therapies. And then when I started my faculty position, I sort of shifted gears for a while and said, you know, I want to be more of a basic scientist and do some more mechanistic studies. And, and that's what I did for my first few years. And then eventually circled back to viral therapies. And the point is that, you know, people ask, should I pick a residency where I can continue my research? And it, I mean, those are considerations, but science is a journey and, and you, you'll sometimes zig and zag a lot depending on, um, you know, what feels right at that moment in time. And so, um, my PhD, um, the skills or the knowledge I have in many ways have long became outdated, but the scientific mindset and the process, that was what I gained from it. Uh, but you can gain that in a variety of ways, including a gap year. And within our field, many of the most um, major accomplishments are, are achieved by people who didn't take time off during training and just went straight into residency. So there's a number of pathways to, to success. Um, I think the other things I, I have a lot of med students come through the lab and, you know, I make sure to work with them on a couple of aspects of it, um, you know, give them the autonomy and freedom to explore, but sort of coach them in terms of grant writing and, and giving talks, because that's an important part of how you um, succeed in this. And so when you end up, you know, choosing to do research, I think it is important to go somewhere where you're not going to just be handed a project, um, but where you're given the freedom to you know, put on paper and in, in presentations, your thoughts on the science and, and be able to personalize it. So we have our med students give uh, lab meetings in a format that would be similar to what they would do if they were uh, visiting sub eye and, and uh, sort of have people in the lab coach them up to throughout the year to get them ready um, for that part of their journey. So 
those are some of the things I would say about the this process, but it's really fun. It should not be, it should never not be fun. I mean, it's um, it's a lot of work, um, but I, I can tell you that, um, uh, you know, all three of us probably enjoy it so much that we don't think of it that way. Yeah, so, I mean, I echo what uh, Dr. Mack and Dr. Augie said. Um, you know, if you think about life, just just if you back up a little bit, and, and in neurosurgery, I think it's an, it's this incredible field, but it is a very consuming field. But I think in your life, you know, your med students now, but at some point, you know, ten years down, you know, five years, life keeps going, right? So other things happen outside of neurosurgery. And I usually tell my mentees, you know, in life, I think when you get to your stride in in life, there's probably you probably need three things in life. Most people. Right there's there's the relationships, whether it's family, marriage, kids, your dog, whatever it is, you need some sort of personal relationship. Second thing is your career, which is your job, and a third is what I call the hobby. Right, something that's just not always about the job. And uh, you know, for I think Dr. Mack and Dr. Agi and myself, we found that hobby and that passion to be really in our, our research. And so, in some ways, it's lucky uh, for us. Or, you know, me in particular, when I'm at work, it's it's either my work or research. And then I, I get to be home with my family and, and I find great fulfillment in that. And I think a, a life of research is, is uh, you get to learn and you get to push the field. Um, and, and I think the components that uh, Dr. Augie and Dr. Mack mentioned about mentorship, about finding unique niches, I, 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 these are all open to you uh, in neurosurgery. You know, at this stage as a medical student, you know, if you decide to take a year, decide to take a research project, you should also look at it to, to see if this is something you want. And, and so it should be an acquisition of skills uh, uh, experience, right? You want to learn about the scientific method or you want to learn how to do clinical research or you want to learn about clinical trials. And then when you get into residency, um, you know, you'll have, you know, two years where you, you may decide to continue doing that. And then... Um, even then, you know, I, I, you know, a lot of the residents that I've, I've mentored over the years, they're, they're all worried. They said, I have to have something that I can take with me to my career. And I, I say, not necessarily, you know, our research years are kind of in the middle and the residents have two clinical years after their two research years. It, the field changes. It's, it's the skills that they get and, and the mentorship that they, uh, they get that um, will prepare them for wherever they go. And as Dr. Max said, you know, he studied neuro, uh, neuroinflammation, but when he got to USC, he uh, met uh, um, engineers and, and uh, um, started learning about environmental effects on, on cerebral vascular disease. You know, those are, he had those skills that were instilled in him. And, um, you know, the other point that I would make is that as neurosurgeons, we have a very unique um, uh, um, position, as Dr. Max said, you know, for me, uh, I have a particular interest in immunotherapy, and you know, we were lucky enough to uh, generate the first preclinical data for anti PD one for GBM, and it's been a really fun journey because I was we were able to generate that data in, in the mouse. We were able to go and use that data as the preclinical data for that Bristol Myers Squibb used to to run a large phase three clinical trial. So we got to see the whole thing go from the lab all the way to clinical trials. Unfortunately, the trial came out negative, but then we had this ability to go back. And so, you know, we were able to go back and find additional markers because as, as surgeons, we can go and, and look at the tissue of our patients. And we found a different molecule called LAG3. And, uh, you know, we, we in phase one clinical data, and now we're going to move into a phase two. And I don't know if you saw the press release, but LAG3 is actually just uh, been shown by BMS to uh, improve survival. So there's the third immunotherapy agent and it's fun to be on the, uh, the cutting edge. Um, but again, it's a journey and you get, um, it's a different aspect. Unlike the basic scientists, which they can't take care of patients uh, like you do, you, you have this ability to go all the way from the bench and take it to a clinical trial and then take it back and, and answer more questions in, in a, a mechanistic way. So um, again, I. I you know, I think all three of us have found uh, great fulfillment in this. Yeah, I was going to I was going to echo what Mike said, and, and I guess Manish said as well. But I think I speak for the three of us. We think we have the best jobs in neurosurgery. I mean, it is just so incredibly fun and um, 
intellectually stimulating to be able to run from the lab to the um, to the clinic to the OR and see all these things that you want to ask about and when discover and it's it's all about the questions that you ask about and the fact of the matter is if you want to get to that position and that sounds like fun to you you will and the people who don't really that does not appeal to them they they won't and that's okay everybody has to you, you can't do this because um it's a checkbox or or it's something you you think you have to do this this i mean as as i said i i come into work every day just so happy to be doing this and it's such a it's such a privilege to be able to do this lab work along with the patient care that um that i can't say enough good things about it Everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.